Let's open our Bibles again to Nehemiah chapter 12 tonight. Nehemiah chapter 12. We're going to do a lot of reading, and uh, God willing, we'll get through this entire chapter tonight. A lot of names. Nehemiah 12, and we'll start off with the first nine verses there. Now these are the priests and the Levites that went up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, Sereah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maluk, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Merimoth, Ido, Genetho, Abijah, Miamin, Maadiah, Bilga, Shemaiah, and Joyarib, Jediah, Salu, Amuk, Hilkiah, Jediah, these were the chief of the priests and of their brethren in the days of Jeshua. Moreover, the Levites, Jeshua, Benui, Cadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Mathaniah, which was over the thanksgiving, he and his brethren. Also, Bakbukiah and Uni, their brethren, were over against them in the watches. Uh, here's another long list of names. And we might ask, why? Uh, why does the Lord spend so much time in the Bible listing obscure and difficult names and he spent so much time in, in little trivial details here and there. The Bible tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Uh, it's also profitable for developing patience and character in you and in me. Uh, don't you think the Lord wants to see what you and I are made of? He already knows, but uh, he gives us a chance to show some faithfulness once in a while, to not give up when we're reading his word. Several years ago, uh, the Reader's Digest company published the Reader's Digest Bible, and uh, they took out anything that was what they thought was superfluous, excessive, all these lists of names. They just eliminated them to shorten the narrative. And any two sections of the Bible that were one seemed to repeat itself, then they would eliminate one. So, so they would condense the Bible into a much easier. Of course, that's what they're in the business of doing, uh, editing great works of literature, <laughs> as Reader's Digest has been doing for decades. But... Um, the list of names, even if they're hard to pronounce, um, and the genealogy tables can reveal that kind of character in you, if you're trusting God and let him do so. Uh, it can reveal that, uh, those qualities, better than probably any other means. Uh, and the Lord's interested in his son. I've said before, out in the world, they say, any friend of so-and-so's is a friend of mine. And the Lord uh, cares about people. He cares about his son because he was a person. God is deeply concerned for those people who accept his son, who brag about his son, who praise his son, who honor his son, and worship his son. So any friend of the Lord Jesus Christ is a friend of God's. Um, look, if you will, over at 1 John, keep your finger here, 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, and one verse there, verse 20. First John 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Uh, Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. There in John chapter 20, verse 28, when Christ appeared to the disciples. Romans 5, verse 8 says, But God committed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The proof of God's love for all men and all people was that Christ became uh, a person and died for all people. 
And God's interested in the work of his son. He's interested in the worship and the following and the praise and the glory of his son. Let's continue, um, starting there at verse 10. And Jeshua begat Joachim. Joachim also begat Eliashib, and Eliashib begat Joiada. And Joiada begat Jonathan. Jonathan begat Jadua. And in the days of Joachim were priests, the chief of the fathers, and Sereah, Mereah, and Jeremiah, Hananiah, of Ezra, Meshulam, of Amariah, Jehohanan, of Meliu, uh, Jonathan, and Shebaniah, Joseph, of Harim, Adna, and Mereoth, Helkeah, of Ido, Zechariah, of Ginnathon, Meshulam, of Abijah, Zikri, of Miniamin, of Moadiah, Piltai, of Bilga, Shamua, and she, of Shemiah, uh, Jeho, Jehohathan, and of Joyarib, Matanei, and Jediah, Uzi, of Salai, Kalai, of Amok, Eber, of Hilkiah, Hashabiah, of Jediah, Nathaniel. Brother Everett criticized me for mispronouncing a few last week. So uh, bear with me, or I'm going to ask him to come and read for me tonight. But on, but on and on go the li- goes the list, uh, just like it does in Exodus chapters, uh, or not Exodus, but um, Ezra, previously chapters 2 and 8 and 10, and back in 1 Chronicles chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, nothing but lists of names and details that don't seem to interest us. The book of Genesis chapters 5 and 10 and 11, and also Genesis 36, a long list of names and records uh, of people. Why do people talk about their children and their grandchildren so much to strangers? We all know someone at work who wants to see the most recent photograph of their son or their grandchildren or if they don't have any young children anymore, they're at least their nieces and nephews. And most of us can bear with them for maybe one or two pictures, but please don't show a whole wallet full. Don't unload a long um, string of pictures because most people won't be interested in them. But the person that loves them the most is very much interested in them. And the Lord Jesus Christ uh, interests the Heavenly Father. And those whose actions foreshadowed the advent, the second advent of Jesus Christ, or foreshadowed the returning of Israel one day after the Antichrist uh, and the return of the Jews to establish the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Anything that was connected with his son uh, in his first advent or his second advent, God considers it important to record that person in his book. I was thinking today about the things that God does think are important enough to record in his book. You know, Roman Catholicism teaches that Simon Peter was made the first pope in Matthew 16. Well, why did the first pope have to be rebuked by a traveling evangelist, the Apostle Paul, for teaching false doctrine, Galatians chapter 2? And he did so publicly in front of other people. And not only that, but God allowed it to be recorded in God in his book and kept there for all to see. That certainly doesn't serve the interests of the papacy to establish the authority of Simon Peter by having someone rebuke him rather than the other way around. But the things that God does consider worth recording in his book, we shouldn't dismiss or treat with uh, cavalierly or lightly. But uh, it's a matter of pride in your children and what they're doing, what they're up to. Uh, Where are they going to school? Who are they dating or getting ready to get to, to marry? Where are they working? Now, why don't we allow God to be just as concerned, just as interested in the people that interest him? Let's keep going, verses 22 to 26. The Levites in the days of Eliashib, Joiada and Johanan, Jadua were recorded, chief of the fathers, also the priest to the reign of Darius the Persian. The sons of Levi, the chief of the fathers, were written in the book of the Chronicles even until the days of Johanan, the son of Eliashib, and the chief of the Levites, Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Cadmiel, 
with their brethren over against them to praise and to give thanks according to the commandment of David, the man of God, ward over against ward. Mataniah and Bakbukiah, Obadiah, Meshulam, Talman, Akub were porters, keeping the ward at the thresholds of the gates. These were, the, these were in the days of Joachim, the sons of Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra, the priest, the scribe. Notice the expression, David, the man of God, there in verse 24. And it pops up again later in verse 36. This is the expression used by TV evangelists and charismatics um, and anyone with sort of a persecution complex against not touching God's anointed. Uh, and it first occurs back in Deuteronomy 33, verse 1. And it was used as the, as the heading over Psalm 90, if you ever see that at the top of the Psalms. Uh, Moses, the man of God. The Bible calls John the Baptist a man sent from God, John 1, verse 6. But he is not referred to as a man of God. The Pharisees said of Christ, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath. There in John 9, verse 16. But the expression, the man of God, is not used in the New Testament of Peter, James, John, Paul, or any of the apostles, Philip, Andrew, etc. The expression is used to its fullest extent back in First and Second Kings, and the ministries of the prophets sent by the Lord. They were all called uh, men of God or the man of God. Eighteen times in First Kings, 29 times in Second Kings. It's used by Manoah and his wife to describe the angel that spoke to them. Judges chapter 13, verses 1 to 8, 1 through 8. Bob Jones Sr. would say that the Old Testament prophets were men called of God in times of apostasy and in times of decline to take God's position in some controversy he had with his people. Take God's side. How many, how many people take God's side these days? Not very many. Sunday, the day of worship for Americans, traditionally, uh, it, the television's filled with political roundtables and talk shows, and not a single one of those contributors on those shows uh, asks the question, well, what does God have to say about this? What does the Word of God say? Or what would be God's interest in this matter for our country? That's never considered. Let's finish the chapter, verses 27 through 47. Pray for me as I read. And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, psalteries, and with harps. And the sons of the singers gathered themselves together both out of the plain country round about Jerusalem and from the villages of Netophathi, um, also from the house of Gilgal and out of the fields of Geba and Asmaveth, for the singers had builded them villages round about Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people and the gates and the wall. That would be a reference, you recall when you read through your Bible, back in the book of Numbers. Uh, God commanded someone who is unclean for having touched a dead body is still required to keep the Passover. So rather than keep it uh, on the 14th of the first month, God said they would keep it on the 14th day of the second month. They'd give them a month to uh, purify themselves and separate themselves to the Lord once again. And so they're making sure all the people met the requirements uh, and the sacrifices met the requirements to be offered by the people as delineated by Moses back in his books. Verse 31. Then I brought up the prince, princes of Judah upon the wall and appointed two great companies of them that gave thanks, whereof one went on the right hand upon the wall toward the dung gate. And after them went Hoshea and half of the princes of Judah and Azariah, Ezra, and Meshulam, Judah, and Benjamin, and Shimeiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priest's sons with trumpets namely Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of, son of Mataniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zachur, the son of Asaph, and his brethren Shemaiah and Azael, Azrael, 
Melali, Gilali, Mai, Nethaniel, and Judah, Hanani with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra, the scribe, before them. And at the fountain gate, which was over against them, they went up by the stairs of the city of David, uh, at the going up of the wall, above the house of David, even unto the water gate eastward. And the other company of them that gave thanks went over against them, and I after them, and the half of the people upon the wall, from beyond the tower of the furnaces, even unto the broad wall. And from above the gate of Ephraim, and above the old gate, and above the fish gate, and the tower of Hananiel, and the tower of Mia, even unto the sheep gate, and they stood still in the prison gate. So stood the two companies of them that gave thanks in the house of God, and I, and the half of the rulers with me. And the priests Eliakim, Maasiah, Miniamin, Micaiah, Elo, Elioenai, Zechariah, and Hanamin, excuse me, and Hananiah with trumpets, and Maasiah, and Shemaiah, and Eleazar, and Uzi, and Johanan, and Malchijah, and Elam, and Ezer, and the singers sang aloud with Jezrahiah their overseer. Also that day they offered great sacrifices, and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also of the children rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard of even afar off. And at that time were some appointed over the chambers for the treasures, for the offerings, for the first fruits, and for the tithes, to gather into them out of the fields of the cities the portions of the law for the priests and the Levites, for Judah rejoiced for the priests and for the Levites that waited. And both the singers and the porters kept the ward of their God, and the ward of the purification according to the commandment of David and of Solomon his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old there were chief of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving unto God. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah gave the portions of the singers and the porters every day his portion. And they sanctified holy things unto the Lord, and the Levites sanctified them unto the children of Aaron. In spite of the continued list of names here, there is some action taking place. There's a great celebration mentioned there in verses 42 and 43 with everyone seeming to participate. And once again, the book or the scriptures make an appearance in connection. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. God's going to say the same thing about the Palestinians uh, and the Syrians and the Saudi Arabians and the Iraqis and the Iranians uh, once again one day. But um, this indicates the power and the authority of God's book to change people, to change cities and change entire nations if they would yield to it. We live in a country where all of the founders of this country once believed in the God of the Bible. Islam and Hinduism and Roman Catholicism, none of those religions had any major part to play in the establishment of this country in its earliest days. This country was established and known by and large as a Protestant country for decades and decades and decades. But politicians get weak and they forget history and they start letting everybody in from every other country. You know, uh, I don't think we should have tests per se for people wanting to run for public office. But what about a religious test for people wanting to apply for citizenship here? That sounds shocking these days. Hopefully nobody will report me to, you know, the government and see my see this video on the internet and say you should see what that guy's saying i have no power to enforce it anyway i'm just speculating only those who have a clear testimony of faith in the god of the bible and more specifically maybe the lord jesus christ should be permitted to be citizens at one time there were tests in all the earliest states uh, that someone had to believe in god in order to run for public office, and I forget which state it was, so I don't want to stay, say which one. They had, uh, they even required some would-be candidate to have a clear testimony of salvation by Jesus Christ, 
before he was considered worthy to be a candidate for public office. But um, having rejected God's word, the United Nations and the United States and the public school system and every other entity that has no interest in God's word or what God reveals through his book, and they dismiss the Bible's history as simply fiction and fairy tales and has no bearing on real life, those people uh, are all going to have to suffer the consequences outlined in God's book. God says, so I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them, that is the wicked, pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One, in Israel. Ezekiel 39, verse 7. When this celebration here got going, quote, the joy of Jerusalem was heard even afar off, verse 43 tells us. That's how a great praise and worship uh, church service ought to be. We should open up the windows when we're singing out loud and let the charismatic church up the street hear how real singing is done. Or let the neighbors in the houses between us and them have a little taste of it. Previously, we read in Ezra 3, verse 13, uh, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. Ezra's celebration marked the rebuilding and the rededication of the temple. Nehemiah's is uh, recognizing the rebuilding of the walls around the temple and around the old city. So there wasn't a whole lot of action, a lot of names, so that's why we were able to go through one chapter tonight. And if there's some detail in there that uh, I missed, maybe we'll come back to it someday.